and welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is bigotry in America and much more. And we're going to try to understand anti-Semitism in U.S. schools uh, with an old friend of ours, Max Semeroff uh, from L.A., who is with Stand With Us. You should remember that name, Stand With Us, a very important organization. Welcome to the show, Max. Thanks so much for having me. So um, just reviewing, you know, the history of the last month or so, we're in, what, day 39 in the war. And um, on the, October 7th, uh, there was a massacre of the worst sort. And uh, we, could, we could discuss some of the hor horrific things uh, that Hamas did, Hamas and also uh, Islamic Jihad did to the Israelis and anyone with them or near them. Um, but... What happened after that was we, you know, we were, I think, all in shock in some ways because there was not a lot of protesting going on, um, either against the massacre or involving, um, you know, the hostages, uh, and uh, you know, people, people were were just in too much in shock, so you didn't see a lot of people out there in the street in an organized protest, but soon thereafter we started seeing protests. Not only uh, in 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 the uh, Middle East, but in Arab countries and the like, um, but but in the U.S. And all of a sudden, it became clear that there was a very substantial, I mean, by hundreds of thousands um, of people in schools and in cities who sided with um, the Palestinian movement and Hamas um, and Hezbollah, for that matter, um, and they were on the streets. And they were ripping the posters of the hostages off the telephone poles. And it was extraordinary. It was a revelation to find that so many people didn't really care much that the massacre had taken place, didn't care much about the hostages. In fact, they, they are deniers, a lot of them, of, of the fact that hostages were taken. I suppose there are some that deny the massacre took place. And instead, they're out there in the streets um, supporting the Palestinians and Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, and they're in the schools. And we saw this in uh, every major college campus. We saw letters and we saw mm, criticism of the administration. We saw job job offerors withdrawing job offers to uh, students who had identified themselves as uh, protesting against the Israelis. So it, we're in a kind of chaos, Max. You must be following this every day. And I wonder if I could, um, you know, take your temperature about what is happening here. And what I found uh, when we talked uh, a few days ago is that you're not only covering college campuses and university campuses, you're covering uh, high schools and even grade schools uh, to see what the story is about anti-Semitism and uh, protests on these issues. Can you tell me the state of affairs? Sure. Um, you know, it's. It's a it, it's a very very difficult time uh, for uh, people in the Jewish community uh, and people who care about the Jewish community. Uh, you know, the last over a month, I think you you mentioned that you didn't see a lot of protests initially. I think people were gathering, but people were gathering to mourn. People were gathering to mourn the single deadliest day for Jewish people since the Holocaust happened. Uh, I think, you know, g gathering to to mourn. Um, I, at this point, I, I can't call it something completely shocking or surprising because if you've been following these issues, I mean, Hamas is a terrorist organization dedicated to the destruction of Israel and, and they express genocidal intentions uh, about murdering Jews in Israel and around the world. Uh, this is far from the first time they've massacred uh, innocent people. Uh, it's by far the largest single massacre they've ever ever been able to pull off, uh, and 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 so it's not entirely surprising for all of us to to see something like this happen, uh, but certainly the scale of it is horrific, uh, and and so I think a lot of people uh, gather to mourn rather than to to protest. We did just see, in fact, yesterday, uh, nearly three hundred thousand people. Uh, Jews and allies gather in the Capitol in Washington, D.C. to protest against the massacre and the taking of so many hostages who, who are, you know, men, women, children, the elderly, Holocaust survivors, babies, 
uh, pregnant women who apparently have given birth uh, in captivity in Gaza. Uh, so, you know, people are protesting to free them. Uh, people are protesting um, really against this massive wave of hate uh, that has taken place as a result of the massacre and, and all the misinformation and propaganda uh, that we've seen spreading on social media. It's unfortunately in traditional mainstream media um, and pushed by a lot of extremist organizations and forces that uh, have been getting organized for a moment like this for a very, very long time, for decades, in fact, in some cases. Um, you know, it, it's it's disheartening to see, but at least for, for someone like me who has been watching this issue for a long time and uh, working on it, uh, it's not shocking, it's just very disappointing. Um, the, the other side of the coin here, I think, is that, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of amazing people, uh, amazing people in the Jewish community, outside the Jewish community, step up uh, and take a leadership role uh, and speak out for what's right. And both in terms of making sure that terrorists from like Hamas and Islamic Jihad can never commit such atrocities ever again. By the way, not just to innocent Israeli civilians, but also all the innocent Palestinian civilians who have suffered under Hamas rule in Gaza for such a long time and are also suffering immensely from this war that Hamas started that was entirely unnecessary, entirely unnecessary, um, as have, frankly, every single war between Israel and Hamas since 2008, 2009 could have been averted had Hamas just decided to change from a terrorist organization into a legitimate government that would negotiate peace on any reasonable basis which they refuse to do. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of people have actually stepped up and, and, and been on the right side of this issue, but there is a very, very loud and extremist minority uh, in higher education. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes also, as you mentioned, in K through 12 schools uh, and in some parts of the media uh, that is, you know, I, I think, um, they, they've they've been uh, louder and more influential than their actual numbers would justify, is the reality. I look at the media because I, I think the media, like social media, has an effect on people. In many ways, maybe it has a greater effect because more people are going to li listen to uh, the conventional media and cable news and, and the like. And uh, I, I have noticed that um, there's this kind of twisted liberal approach um, where they, including channels that you would watch, commentators and broadcasters that you would ordinarily watch, um, and you know they've been covering the Ukraine war, they've been covering politics in Washington, um, and you know they have a certain amount of credibility. But they, in a number of them, have lost credibility with me because they always start um, with Israel's, um, um, you know, genocidal intentions against the Palestinians, which is a lie. And, um, and that's where the raw meat news is. And that's where, you know, uh, I have, I've been very disappointed with some of these cable, I mean, large cable networks. It's interesting too that, and this is really remarkable, that Fox News, which I, you know, in the past, I have refused to watch even for a moment. Fox News is giving better coverage than MSNBC and CNN, and to some extent, BBC, um, because of that phenomenon of going for the raw news and, you know, doing the knee-jerk attack on, the, on Israel. Uh, and this, I think, exacerbates the problem. And the problem, of course, is what are these kids on these campuses thinking? Um, what are they doing? Why are they out there? Are they informed? Uh, what is motivating them to get together by the tens of thousands write letters and make protests, and in fact, um, reject any argument by Israeli or Jewish organizations. I told you before the show about a specific incident of which I am familiar, with which I am familiar, where um, BDS, and I want to ask you about how BDS is doing these days, uh, BDS um, refused to let Hillel participate in a college campus conversation about this sort of thing. So uh, it's not like a fair educational experience 
It's not like academic freedom at all. It's something else. And my question to you is, you know, what is the strange process that leads our students in so many national schools to behave like this? Is this something that came from BDS? Is this a, a morphing of BDS into something else? Is BDS part of it? Is it a leader in this? Uh, how are these kids getting so motivated? Yeah, so first, you know, BDS, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement uh, Against Israel, uh, a lot of people, I mean, BDS itself will kind of market itself as a human rights movement uh, and an effort to uh, pressure Israel regarding its policies uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, the reality of the situation is, and, and, you know, you can read statements from the leaders of the BDS movement in other contexts or, you know, even their stated goals, uh, it's not about changing Israeli policy. It's not about uh, Palestinian human rights in general. It's about eliminating Israel, uh, making it so Israel no longer exists. And in fact, in the immediate aftermath of the Hamas massacre in southern Israel, the BDS movement released an official statement uh, explicitly supporting Hamas, explicitly supporting their quote-unquote armed resistance. Um, so it, I think it's it's very important to understand understand what BDS actually stands for, um, because they're, they're often not very honest about it when they're speaking to, you know, university audiences or other audiences um, across the United States. Um, so, yes, BDS is, is, is part of this picture. Um, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's one part of it. The bigger picture here is that, uh, particularly in humanities departments, you know, we're talking about uh, like anthropology, like sociology, ethnic studies, history, uh, any one of these kind of humanities departments, um, there's at this point been a fairly long-standing bias against Israel and sometimes also uh, in some ways against the Jewish community. Um, it's not the same in every single university department. I just saw recently a graphic uh, showing basically how many professors from different types of departments had signed letters uh, either condemning Hamas or, um, you know, one-sided condemnations of Israel. Um, and if you looked at the humanities departments, it was overwhelmingly biased against Israel. If you looked at the the rest of the departments, you see business, STEM, what have you, uh, then, you know, you have a much more, I think, level-headed view of the situation um, than, than these one-sided statements. So why, why is it in... in in these humanities departments that we have this bias. So the big picture reason is, is a matter of ideology and narrative, right? So there's a sort of a, a broad, um, I think, uh, intellectual stream of thought that focuses on anti-colonialism that frames, you know, basically most if not all of the world's problems as a result of specifically European colonialism and uh, it looks at basically relationships between different groups of people as if you are the stronger party, uh, then you are pretty much automatically the oppressor. And if you're the weaker party, you're automatically the oppressed. And it's there's oh, it's basically a black and white picture of who's right in the scenario and who's wrong. Um, now, the reality is, I mean, colonialism was horrific for many, many people. I'm sure that, you know, living in Hawaii, You've seen, you know, pe people watching this have seen uh, some of the negative impacts of colonialism in one way or another. Um, so that's a legitimate academic conversation that we should have. Um, the problem is applying these types of concepts to a conflict in the Middle East between Israelis and Palestinians where they actually make no sense. I mean, yes, there's British colonialism in the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, other forms of colonialism, like, for example, the Ottoman Empire, um, or even before that, uh, various Arab and Islamic empires that conquered that land. But Jews, I mean, for Jews, Israel is the homeland of the Jewish people. It's been the homeland of the Jewish people for over 3,000 years. Um, Jews who came, you know, back to their homeland in the 1800s and 1900s from Europe and later from across the Middle East and other parts of the world, uh, they weren't coming as representatives of some foreign colonial power. They were coming as people who had been oppressed as a minority for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in those societies. And 
we're saying basically enough is enough. We're not going to be an oppressed minority anymore. We're going to go back to our homeland and be free once again and have the right to self-determination once again. Uh, so basically, these, these broad concepts, these broad streams of intellectual thought get applied in completely inaccurate ways to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And so people decide that the Israelis are quote unquote colonizers and the Palestinians are their indigenous victims. Uh, and so any violence that happens against Palestinian, uh, sorry, against Israeli civilians by terrorist groups like Hamas is justified in the name of decolonization. And this is how basically you get very, very highly educated people to go out onto the streets or onto social media and justify just the brutal slaughter, sexual assault, torture, maiming of innocent people who happen to be of the wrong ethnicity and religion. That's a sliver of it, but that, 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 that's, that's, I think, a big part of the problem. Do you think that the people who um, protest in favor of Hamas on these campuses know um, what happened in the massacre? Do you think they know what's going on with BDS and the way um, you know BDS is organized and its mission, and for that matter, the way these terror organizations are organized? And do they know, or are they simply ignorant? You know, it seems all these um, um, humanities uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, de departments in these schools would be sensitive on a historical basis to all this. But are they teaching this uh, or are they rather teaching hate? Uh, it's impossible to generalize. Uh, maybe there are some people who know exactly what happened and still think it's justified. I mean, we saw a clip of a professor from Cornell saying that it was, quote, exhilarating. Uh, to to watch uh, the you know the massacre unfold on October seventh, um, so uh, and you know to what extent like people like that have you know saw the actual atrocities uh, and were still willing to celebrate or or justify them. Uh, I'm sure that there's some people in that category. I think there's other other people who uh, basically have have internalized so much bias against. Israelis, in some cases against Jews, uh, that they will just refuse to believe anything that frames, you know, ba basically anything that frames innocent Israeli civilians as being subject to any kind of unjustified attack um, or, or you know, you know, in this case, a brutal massacre. Uh, I think the the other piece of the the puzzle here is that, you know. It seems like some some folks, is, you know, in 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 you know these humanities departments and and elsewhere, those that they influence in the media and and on social media, um, find it very very difficult to walk and chew gum at the same time, right? So we can all, I mean, if we want to acknowledge reality, we have to recognize yes, Palestinians and 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 you know Palestinian political factions and 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 terrorist groups and what have you. They're much weaker in various ways than the people of Israel and the state of Israel is correct, that there is a power differential between the two. And also at the same time, you can have the governments in Gaza and in, in the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority, make terrible decisions that are very harmful for both Palestinians, their own people, and Israelis, and that they should be held accountable for those decisions. Uh, and and for how for for how they use what power they do have, right? so it, it it's it's disappointing and disheartening. But I I think those of us who are kind of you know in the middle and and trying to help in some way um, need to be able to like I said walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, everyone in a leadership position in a position of power uh, involved in this conflict should be held accountable for the decisions that they make whether they're Israeli, whether they're Palestinian, whether they're from the international community and having some kind of influence. Um, and I, I think this black and white view of the world is a big part of the problem. Mm. So um, what, what, what should a good university do when it sees this happen? What should a, a good university president do? David Lasner is the president, and he's Jewish, of University of Hawaii, and he's organized some kind of event where he finally is going to speak about this. 
what should he say? What should he do? What standards should he should he adopt or not in order to make this more rational and sound more like uh, academic freedom? You know that that takes into account all arguments on all sides. Well, I, I think number one, just starting from a baseline of recognizing the humanity of Israelis, recognizing the humanity of Palestinians, recognizing the immense suffering that is happening right, right now without moral equivocations or moral equivalencies that paper over the fact that this is a com this was a completely unnecessary war launched with a brutal terrorist massacre by Hamas and other terrorist groups in Gaza against Israeli civilians. Uh, you know, I, I think that's a starting point. Um, I think also clear condemnations. I, you know, I'm not aware of specific anti-Semitic incidents that have, may have happened at University of Hawaii. I'm aware of many, many incidents that have happened at many other universities and in communities across the country. I think, you know, unfortunately, also, you know, so Jew, Jews are uh, targeted with more religious-based hate crimes than any other group. They have been well before this war happened, but it's even worse right now. Um, there have also been anti-Muslim hate crimes, uh, which are horrific and should be part of the conversation as well. So I think that's kind of the second part of it is uh, clear condemnations of any incidents of hate, whether against it's against the Jewish community, against Israeli Americans, against Palestinian, Muslim, and Arab Americans. Um, I think those are all baseline messages that need to be sent. And from there, uh, I think it's really about moral leadership and intellectual leadership and calling on the entire university community to have a more honest, fact-based, and constructive conversation about this issue instead of one that only fuels more divisions and hatred and conflict, which is clearly what we're seeing far too often on university campuses. What about sanctions, Max? I mean, uh, if I find that one of my faculty members, say in the humanities department, uh, is fomenting hatred, is teaching students how to hate and how to protest uh, in favor of those who would hate, um, what do I do about that? Do I let him or her continue that that effort, or do I throw them out of school? And what happens with um, you know seniors uh, who have uh, tenure? Uh, what do I do with them? Um, it, now it was up to me. I might add my own digression here: is I would throw them out of school because our community should not be trusting uh, the development of young minds to people who would teach hate. That's a bad way to develop uh, an electorate and, and citizens in our uh, democracy. But I think, you know, for me, I'd like to see some sanctions. There haven't really been a lot of sanctions, have there? Well, we have seen that on certain universities, there have been extremist student groups who actually violated campus policies or, or may have violated the law in some way. We've seen some of those groups actually get suspended. Uh, which uh, I think universities have been hesitant to do in the past, uh, but the, just the, the level of, you know, hateful rhetoric and, and justifications of violence on top of the uh, violations of, of various, you know, policies or laws, I think has has gotten universities to that point where they're willing to take more significant action. Uh, in terms does, of- Does it work? Does it work suspending them? Does it actually well, have the desired effect? We'll see. We'll see. It just happened. You know, it, in many of these cases, it literally just happened in the last you know week or or, or very short time span. So, um, so we'll see what effect it has. But in terms of sanctions, uh, so we strongly, my organization and I personally strongly believe in academic freedom, and I think the best answer to bad ideas is more good ideas, um, which in and for the, the public to, to see that debate play out and, and make up their own minds. Uh, I think the problem is on many university campuses is, and, and, and certainly in some departments more than others, you don't actually have a very meaningful debate or exchange of ideas where the bad ideas can be you know, effectively marginalized uh, and called out for the bad ideas that they are. So I think 
rather than necessarily you know jumping to sanctions, which in some cases would be appropriate, but it really it's very case by case. You know, if if someone has actually clearly violated a university policy or 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 law or or what have you, um, in general, I I think the more important thing for universities is to start investing resources in actually having a meaningful debate and meaningful pushback against some of the extremism, frankly, that they've let fester uh, under their watch for decades now. You know, a lot of universities, frankly, are suffering intense reputational damage because, not because they just allow all voices to be heard on their campuses, that's fine, that's what they should do, but rather for allowing an echo chamber of extremism and hate to fester in too many of these departments without meaningful challenges from uh, people with other perspectives. So that's what I think really needs to change. You know, you referred to the nexus uh, between, and maybe it's a very close embedded nexus uh, between these protests, I mean, the uh, anti-Israeli protests and anti-Semitism. And we know that in this country, we have had anti-Semitism historically for a long, long time. And um, we know th that if you, you if you look at the uh, the history of the last months, we know there have been an awful lot of protests against the Israelis. So, hmm, what what how close is that? How close is that nexus? What is the connection between anti-Semitism and let's call it uh, anti-Zionism, if you will? Um, because it, it seems to me that um, that even if you were able to establish a meaningful dialogue and have uh, academic freedom on open discussion of the of the rational points on all sides of the table. As long as you have anti-Semitism in there, which is not rational, but deeply embedded in our society, you never can solve the problem. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think so to answer your first question, what, what's the connection? Uh, so if you're criticizing the Israeli government regarding an issue of policy, uh, you know, a anyone can do that and it's not anti-Semitic. We just were watching before, shortly before this massacre happened, a huge Israeli protest movement in Israel against the current government. Um, and and certainly, you know, that wasn't based in anti-Semitism. You can criticize the Israeli government without being anti-Semitic. There are specific types of rhetoric and actions related to Israel that do cross that line. So that would be like if you are denying Israel's right to exist or calling for Israel's destruction, that's a form of anti-Semitism. Uh, similar to that, you know, if you're denying that Jews, saying that Jews, unlike all other people, um, don't have a right to self-determination in their ancestral homeland, that's a form of anti-Semitism or discrimination against Jews. Uh, if you're demonizing Israelis or dehumanizing them uh, with you know, any number of anti-Semitic tropes that go back hundreds of years, or sometimes in, in the modern age, you know, Israelis are being dehumanized, like I said before, uh, by being labeled as colonizers, erasing 3,000 years of Jewish history there and basically justifying their 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 slaughter by terrorists. Um, so unfortunately, part of the complexity with anti-Semitism is it doesn't stay the same throughout time. It evolves. It changes with whatever the sort of uh, common streams of thought are and you know streams of uh, of language are in any given society. Uh, and so we constantly have to adapt to how this hatred against Jews evolves from the far left, from the far right, from uh, other types of extremists. Um, and I agree with you, it's, it's, it's impossible to have a rational discussion uh, from, from someone who has adopted just irrational, anti-Semitic, hateful ideas. Uh, I think the core there's 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 a few ways to go about dealing with it. Education has to be at the center of it, right? Our educational institutions have a huge, huge responsibility to uh, not just in response to anti-Semitic incidents, but rather proactively educate about who are the Jewish people, who are Jewish Americans, what is anti-Semitism, both historically but also today in all of its forms, and including the more uncomfortable conversation about what is anti-Semitism related to Israel, uh, and how do we together 
fight against anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred in our society. Um, I, you know, I, I think that every educational institution has a role to play in that. And if they fulfill those responsibilities, we'll be in a much better place. Including the high schools and grade schools, right? Yeah, that's where it has to start. Yeah. Well, you know, because you develop these biases, these bigotry um, very early on. In fact, that's what happens in a lot of Arab countries where they teach very, very young children to hate the Jews. Well, you and know they carry ironic? that their whole lives. You know what's ironic is that because of the Abraham Accords, which are the peace deals between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and uh, Morocco, um, and, and, and the increasing level of sort of, uh, you know, diplomatic relations and other connections between uh, Israelis and people across the Arab world, we've actually seen uh, curriculum in a number of Arab countries start pretty significantly improving, uh, removing various types of anti-Semitic content, uh, including more positive representations of Jews. I mean, it's nothing's going to change overnight, but there's actually some positive developments happening in the Arab world. Certainly there were before this massacre took place. Um, at the same time, as it seems, there are negative developments taking place in the education systems in the United States. So just let that sink in for a minute. We here, in some cases, are going in the wrong direction. And Israel's new, you know, the, the states that Israel now has, now has diplomatic relations with are headed in the right direction. Um, I think it's, I hope it's, you know, in all of our, for, for all of our interests and values that we should want to turn ourselves around as well on this issue. On so many issues, actually, when you start talking American politics and public policy and public opinion, which leads me to, uh, to ask you, you know, uh, how, has, how has the media been doing in terms of um, educating people here in this country? And, and a further question, which is just equally important, is how has the Israeli government been doing in educating people in this country and the world on what has been happening, what did happen, what's been happening? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I, I think if, if you've been following the media coverage of this issue to any significant extent, you probably remember that there was a really, really terrible moment of many very widely trusted media outlets, uh, the New York Times, others, reporting that basically, supposedly, an Isra Israeli strike had hit a hospital in Gaza and that 500 people were killed in that strike. And then, very, very shortly after, you had the facts come out that, well, actually, it didn't hit the hospital, it hit a parking lot outside the hospital. And in fact, it wasn't an Israeli strike. It was actually a rocket from a, a terrorist organization in Gaza that fell short. And in fact, it wasn't 500 people killed. The estimates quickly were reduced to maybe 50 or 100. All of it horrific, all of it tragic. But at the same time, the immense, immense, immense damage done around the world by this screaming headline and the photos associated with it, the story. I mean, the New York Times eventually had to backtrack and apologize for that. But the damage was very much done by the time they did that backtracking, right? And I mean, I, I think it's it's gotten more people to realize that, well, maybe we shouldn't just take at face value the reports coming out of the Gaza Ministry of Health, which is in fact, controlled by Hamas, which is the government of Gaza, maybe you shouldn't just trust the reports coming from the terrorist organization that just went into Israel and massacred and sexually assaulted civilians and, you know, broadcasted it on, on GoPros um, and, and on the social media accounts of some of their victims, um, and then later proceeded to go on various media outlets and deny the atrocities they had just committed and documented for so many around the world to see. Maybe we shouldn't just trust them. It's I, happening I, again. I, yeah. A similar test now with that big hospital in Gaza City, um, yeah, I, where the Israelis have, have uh, documented uh, a clear evidence that it was being used, as they suggested earlier, as a, a Hamas headquarters. 
And yet, yeah, and, not, and yet, and, I'm not convinced the press is giving us the story. Yeah, and, and it's not, it's not, and it's just not just the Israeli government. The U.S. government and intelligence community has also come out and confirmed that uh, this that Hamas terrorists have used this hospital uh, for military purposes, which is a war crime and horrific. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I I think that some of some of these examples of mainstream media just repeating misinformation fed to them by a horrific genocidal terrorist group, I think it has opened some people's eyes, but also the damage is already done. And there are far too many people around the world who still believe erroneously that Israel was responsible for that strike against the hospital. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's very disheartening. Uh, I can only hope that there there will be the appropriate accountability and fallout from this long term. Uh, but this, frankly, it's not it's not the first time we've seen major ma major errors like this happen. Um, it's just maybe the largest in scale we've seen in a long time. Um, so we we need a reckoning. Yeah, we need a reckoning sure. among a, a number of media organizations that did the same thing. It wasn't only the New York Times, it was the cable news channels and it went as far as the BBC. I, I have seen BBC reports that were completely erroneous and biased. Um, and it's like they were proving a case against Israel when in fact there was no case against Israel. The case was against Hamas. And it's only now, you know, 39 days after is the horrific attack um, that some of the facts about the massacre are coming out because the Israelis have been reluctant out of a kind of cultural sensibilities to reveal all the things that Hamas did. Um, there was an article in the New York Times or maybe Washington Post this morning about how the rape that was going on, um, you know, was was awful. And it was like a lot of women were raped and sexually abused and paraded in the streets. And uh, I don't know if, if this is, uh, you know, confirmed by intelligence, but um, the article suggested that why 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 would they stop raping those same women who are in captivity? They would keep on doing it. So captivity turns into be a seventh circle, um, you know, for all those people. God knows what they're doing to them. But let me let me ask you this. Uh, you know, my feeling is that Israel didn't really understand the international global propaganda war at first. And then after a while, if you watch the news reports, you began to get a picture of what they were like, what their generals were like, what their citizen soldiers were like, um, what the, the families of the hostages were like as people, as human beings. And that uh, somehow along the way countered some of the outrageous propaganda that was coming from Hamas. So um, I'd like to ask you this, you know, you, you spend your life, you're a career person fighting against bigotry. And a lot of people, including a lot of Jews in this country, have been sidelining those issues for hmm, their lives. Uh, and to some extent, they continue now, although we do see groups, as we saw last weekend, of, of Jewish people, people who support the Jewish state out there you know, demonstrating. But what can I do, aside from think tech here, uh, what can people do to join with you? You say, stand with us. What do we have to do to stand with you, Max? So number one, we encourage, we're an education organization. Uh, we educate people around the world about Israel and fight anti-Semitism around the world. Uh, so we encourage everyone to educate yourself about these issues. Uh, we have a lot of educational materials on our website, standwithus.com. Uh, also on our social media feed, uh, if you follow us on, on Instagram or, or whatever your preferred social media platform is, we're constantly sharing educational information. Um, so number one, educate yourself. And number two, uh, educate others, other people around you, your friends, your loved ones. Um, you know, I, I think for us, every all of this uh, really starts with education. Uh, if you experience or you hear about some kind of anti-Semitic incident, uh, we have a reporting form on our website, again, standwithus.com, um, where you can report things to us and our legal department or another appropriate department 
will re review the issue uh, and and uh, and respond in the appropriate way. Um, and you know, beyond that, uh, I think wh whether whether you're Jewish, whether you're not Jewish, um, I think it's very very important, especially at a time like this with a war going on and immense, immense amounts of misinformation swirling around, all of it meant to, a lot of it meant to really divide and fuel hate. Um, I think it's very important to slow down, to take a minute to not immediately, you know, believe every outrageous headline that you see or, or every outrageous thing someone tells you, uh, but rather dig deeper into it, figure out what the truth is, what different sides of the issue are reporting, um, and and avoid avoid fanning the flames because the flames are intense right now. Um, and and we need we need more 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 uh, more more firefighters out there um, spreading the truth and 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 lowering the flames, the hatred we're seeing across our society today. That's something to keep in mind at a Thanksgiving dinner where somebody was invited who may be a hate person and goes on about, a, you know, top of, top of the line, top of the news stack issue um, and begins criticizing Israel and is misinformed. And it puts a test to all of us to exactly how to handle that. Um, do you leave? Um, do you argue? Uh, do you... What do you do? What do you, what do you do? Do you get angry? Um, do you, and if you keep talking, will he let you talk or she? Um, how do you handle that? It, it, this is a very likely possibility in our world today. Well, I, I think it's uh, it's generally important in situations like that to to ask questions. Right? Someone who feels very very strongly about an issue, if you immediately start to argue, uh, to to tell them why they're wrong, uh, in one way or another. Uh, for the vast majority of people, the instinct is going to be to get defensive, um, not engage with an opposing idea with an open mind, but rather to just double down on whatever your original belief or your original idea is. Uh, so, it's very very difficult to have a productive conversation in that setting if you're just going to start arguing. Um, I think it's important to ask people questions. You know, they put a certain statement out there or make a certain accusation. Um, like, what do you mean by that? Get them to define their terms, get them to give you a better sense of uh, what do they actually know about the issue in question. Um, maybe you know more than them. Maybe you, you, maybe you actually have some facts that may surprise them. But it's a much more open conversation if you can start asking genuine questions to delve into why someone has come arrived at the beliefs that they have. Well, that's um, why it's important, as you said, to educate yourself, to be completely ready for that conversation. Um, yeah. And and uh, I, uh, I I think it's important that everybody be familiar with what's going on and be able to um, speak on it. Max, thank you so much for speaking to me. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate these discussions with you, and I, I look forward to more, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. Max Samaroff. Thanks for having me. Aloha.